This is Alan from Primordial, telling you you are listening to the Phantasm Podcast with Dr. Vincent West. Phantasm. Maximum terror. Ah! That's your target audience, baby! Phantasm. Did you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm. Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Ah! Ah! Hey, this is Dr. Vincent West, medical doctor with the Phantasm Podcast. I'm ecstatic to finally say after eight years of this podcast, we have Alan joining us from Primordial, who I've wanted on since day one. Finally getting to chat with him about this incredible new record, How It Ends. Metal Bait Records came out on September 29th. Alan, thank you for taking the time to do this. No problem. <clears throat> That's all right. Always my pleasure to speak to a, a medical man. Cool. Uh, well, I'm happy to have you on today. Uh, so when did you guys uh, start the uh, writing process for How It Ends? Um, I suppose really in earnest, just over a year ago, um, maybe September, October last year, um, we decided to sort of light a little fire under ourselves and um, begin in earnest the process. I think once you have a date looming to start recording it starts to um, focus your attention and that's exactly what we did and um, it was quite a concentrated frenetic period of creativity but um, well you have what you have at the end of it and that's uh, how it ends so with this album as opposed to really anything else you guys have ever done um and just to tell you as a fan, I enjoy Primordial Records for the simple fact that the entire record is an experience as opposed to like singles and whatnot like that. Um, what was different about this record as opposed to any record you've ever done before? Um, <clears throat> well, you're an entirely different set of atoms than you were 30 years ago, but... Um, I mean, look, Primordial has, um, we have our own furrow that we plow, so to speak, our own particular niche. We don't have an awkward electronic period. We don't have an acoustic album for you to have to turgidly digest. We just do what we do, and more or less, no one really sounds exactly like us, and we don't really sound that much like anybody. So if you like Primordial, it's not going to be a drastic departure from albums before. Um, but... The biggest thing really is after X amount of years of playing in a band is to be able to step outside the parameters or the bubble or whatever you want to call it of the band and objectively consider, uh, do we still sound like we mean it? Do we still sound like we have something to say? Do we still sound um, full of energy and passion and whatever all those other defining um, words are? And um, that's we felt that, yes, we did. And so um, this was album number 10 in the canon. Um, and I think they all, you know, they, they all form, form the body of Primordial, but they're all individual chapters in the, in the book, so to say. Um, I just think, I, I think it's more maybe, objectively, it's more, of, it's more angry, it's more um, epic, heavy metal in some, in some ways. It's a bit, it's a bit more, um, a bit more aggressive than the last album, Exile Amongst the Ruins, which was maybe a little bit darker, a little bit more introspective, I suppose, on some level. So those are the main differences. If you thought we were boring before, you're still going to find us boring. So, <laughs> you know, okay. Not at all. I'm such a huge fan. Like I said, it's it's every record, it's like getting to take a, a journey with you guys. Um, and, and speaking of how it ends, uh, what can you tell us about the track, how it ends, the first track on the, on the album? Um, well... Initially, we had different ideas about which should be the opener or not. Um, and this one always struck me as, yeah, that I, I just, it was to me inevitable that this would be the, um, the opening song. 
I mean, what do you mean, like lyrically or? Yeah, just anything you wanted to say about the track. Um, well, you know, the, the album How It Ends is full of a lot of questions for people if they um, do so desire to get into the lyrics. Um, it's not... The album is sort of looks back over, I suppose, the start of the 20th century till now at, let's say this, if To The Nameless Dead album was about um, the movement of borders and nations and um, the eclipsing of peoples and that kind of thing. This is kind of about... It's, it's historically set... Um, I suppose it's set among what we could call romantic characters um, of resistance, doomed resistance from history, uh, which sort of has echo and resonance with the modern day. So I didn't want to write like a modern day lockdown political type album. It's not really what Primordial is about. So it's, it's rooted in a sort of echoes of history. But um, I think the the questions in that song are quite simple. They are, um, liberty is the most important word in the English language um, or in any language. And the pursuit of liberty is the pursuit of all people's emancipation, whether it was resisting colony or empire or the authoritarian excesses of the modern world. And it's sort of asking the question, um, you know, who are they now? And have we handed it over? too much of our um, liberty to an incoming uh, form of authoritarianism, I suppose. Um, so the song is like a warning. How did you feel when they called your name for the last time and made you stand in line, etc.? Um, it's a warning uh, from me, <laughs> uh, stating that um, democracy is not the default setting of society. And if you, th if you think that and take it for granted, and you think things like freedom of speech or gaslighting then you're a fool right it's basically um, that's the basic tone so serious stuff ain't no messing around <laughs> I love it um, what about the second track Plows to Rust Swords to Dust um, well the main Plows to Rust it's um, I like this phrase I suppose it's kind of about the economic progress uh, if I understand it correctly, it's, an, it's about the economic progress from industrialization. Um, it's a kind of Russian phrase, for, um, a Soviet phrase. Um, again, this is a kind of historically set romantic, not romantic, actually I don't mean romance in the way some people may think of it. I suppose what I mean by that is there are characters in all nations' history who inform the modern day, whether they're poets or writers, from the left and the right, or neither, as the case may be, um, that kind of um, we romanticize. So, you know, that song states some men um, give their lives for... Um, I can't remember my own lyrics. Um, love, verse, and labor. I think that some women give their lives for love, right. verse, and labor. Some men give their lives for flag, faith, and nation. And that's kind of the idea. It's about what motivates young people to give their lives to a higher ideal um, knowing that they're doomed I suppose right um, and and it's I sort of set this idea in relation to this period um, I suppose in America it would be the Gilded Age 1880 to 1910 leading up to the First World War um, and so in Western um, in Western sort of um, some areas of Western literature, this was seen as the kind of leading up to the First World War as the end of the Greco-Roman sort of ro romantic age of, of, of Europe or something like this. Right. But it's not really only about Europe. So, um, again, similar themes, similar thematic, I suppose. It's brilliant. Um, what about track three, We Shall Not Serve? I think the clue is in the title. Not serve, yeah. <laughs> Um, which is interestingly linked to James Joyce, the, the title, the concept of non serviam. Oh. Again, this is, um, yeah, if you look into James Joyce, it's quite interesting, a famous Irishman. Um, well, We Shall Not Serve is sort of self explanatory, really. It's, um, but echoes of We Shall Not Serve are set. Um, it's, see, they're all, their things are kind of slightly 
tied into each other. This I like this. There's this character in Irish history called Joseph Plunkett, um, who's a famous famous poet and nationalist, um, and he was shot by the English in Kilmainham Jail after the rising, and he married this woman called Grace. Um, and there's a famous Irish song called Grace. People who like Irish traditional music might know it. Hmm. And he, they were married the night before he was shot. And so um, these are the kind of characters I was sort of looking at in relation to some of the inspiration for the album. Um, doomed, the doomed romantic heroes of our, of our past who have been forgotten and whose contributions to the state dwarf the cultural nonsense that we find most of our lives inhabiting right now right. and things that just don't matter in the grand scheme. Um, so I've, I've put in a verse or two from him in the end of the song um, and it's really just stating in simple terms um, in, at the end of the day is every concept of liberty resolved at the barrel of a gun um, and that, that's looming in our future. Right. There you go. Awesome. Um, and then I will butcher this with my Florida accent, so I'm going to let you take it away here on track four. I, I can try to pronounce it, but I don't know if I should. <laughs> you mean tradition? Yes, sir. Thank you. Just means tra- just means tradition in Irish. Oh, okay. No, no big dark secret to that song. So, anything musically or lyrically you'd like to say about that one? Um, well, it's just. Um, Kieran, the guitar player, he wanted to do this version of a bothy band song. I think it's called uh, The Ballantour Fancy, I think is the original name of the song. And it's a cover of a band called The Bothy Band. Oh. If people want to cover them. There you go. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, track five, Pilgrimage to the World's End. Um, well, this is about, I suppose, the fact that people are still getting into boats to cross expanses of sea to try and find new lives in um, other countries. They're forced from one to the other by the exploits of power and finance and war. Uh, so it's sort of about migrants, refugees. But I've set it in the 19th century. Um, and it's, it's fundamentally about Irish people who are forced to leave to go to Australia um, in, you know, sent as convicts to the to Australia, um, so it has uh, some echoes of Ned Kelly and mm. resistance figures um, within that. But it could be, it could be said now. It's um, so it's it's uh, I, I, it's one of those songs that doesn't have a huge lyrical message. It's more about the poetic um, construct of the words. You know, the whole setting of ancient ports where no ships will ever dock, and that kind of thing. So. Oh. It made me, you talking about that, it made me think about my, my birth mother, who I've never met, was Cuban. And that's how oh, I yeah, ended up landing in Florida. So, yeah, uh, it's interesting. Oh, well, all this stuff is, yeah, that's interesting. It could be, um, I mean, I've, I've been quite interested in like Haitian Revolution history recently. Oh. Um, and Irish people sent us convicts to the Caribbean. Mm. Um, they're, called, they're called Red Legs, I think. They were oh. taken as slaves. Um, they're like, um, yeah, quite interested in some of those concepts. Um, again, you know, people from all around the world taken as slaves and sent for me to be. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a prescient song for an awful lot of the things that are happening now, I think, you know, because we're going to witness massive um, refugee up- upheavals over the next five or ten years and in the next 12 to 24 months, no doubt about it. Absolutely. Um what about uh, another brilliant song? Uh, track six, Nothing New Under the Sun. This is about um, splitting the atom. Uh, I wrote this before I even knew about the movie Oppenheimer. Oh, okay. And it's, really, it's really just about, you know, um, I suppose that famous footage of Oppenheimer, Now I Am Death, Now I've Become Death, Destroyer of Worlds. And it's really just about that, that nothing new is under the, no, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, including the atom that was split that could destroy everything under the sun, I suppose. Um, how we harbor the power to um, well, end everything. So that's kind of what that's about. Oh, wow. 
You know, I haven't seen Oppenheimer yet. Is it worth watching? Yeah, um, it is. It's what's unusual about Oppenheimer is um, you. Let me say this. How do I say this? You see more. You get to see more sex scenes than you do get to see the aftermath of the actual destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Gotcha. And there was archival footage of that, which he could have used, but he doesn't. So it, 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 maybe I'm, maybe I think too little of people, but a part of me wonders for some of the people who would go and see Oppenheimer, did they actually know quite what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I thought it maybe would have been, um, maybe useful to the narrative to show some of the archive footage, but I guess he didn't want to go and do that. So you see Oppenheimer watching the footage. We don't get his reaction. You mm. get more court scenes from like McCarthyism and stuff afterwards. Oh. Um, but it is good. It is good. It, it glosses over a couple of things, you know, glosses over, it glosses over death and destruction too much. I thought it could have been an awful lot more grim. Okay. Um, and I also think that the, um, the Liberty, or whatever you call it, the first explosion um, footage where they recreated the, the um, explosion, just used the archival footage, it's way darker than um, your planned, you know, your modern explosion equivalent. Cool. It doesn't, qu- doesn't at all fill you with the same awe or dread as the original footage. But anyway, he can hardly set off um, uh, a nuclear explosion. So anyway, it's it's good. Yeah, worthwhile. I mean, in if I mean, in amongst the useless shit that Hollywood pumps out, um, you had your moral decision: um, remove your brain and go and see Barbie, or see something like Oppenheimer. That was <laughs> right. that seemed to be the cultural. <laughs> that seemed to be the cultural choice at the time. Um, so there you go. Gotcha. Um, another one I may need your help with, track seven. I'm going to try to do this one. Call to Sarah Nunos? Yeah, call to Sarah Nunos, yeah. yeah. Well, Nunos is like a, a Celtic god figure. Um, it's a really simple song. It's not, there's not really so much you can say about it. It's just, um, it's just a kind of like a pagan song written in 20 minutes. It's a call and response between the harmony and the vocal. And just about pre-Christian, um, you know, pagan, you know, religious observance that, um, you know, living in harmony with nature as opposed to being opposed to it. Um, yeah, there's no, again, no deep dark secret to this song. Brilliant. It's a, the, this record is just like all your stuff. I just love it. It's such a, you, like I said, it's like you take on this journey with you guys. It's so awesome. Uh, track eight, All Against All. All Against All is, again, pretty self-explanatory. This is an observation that maybe um, we're reaching some strange, we're on our way up to some sort of peak, some crescendo um, of opposition. I think what it is is that um, people are being played by the... I'm loath to call them like the elite or the 1% or whatever you want to say. Sure. I don't think that's true. I think it's many, many institutions of um, governance, of control, of financial, economic, cultural, social control. How by, how your average person, how people are being played, divide and conquer. And that the things that we spend our time tearing strips off each other through modern tribalism um, are deliberate. And if people could just step sideways a tiny bit and see, try and see what they have in common with other people, as opposed to opposed to them, um, I, I suppose that's that's the that's the light version of what the song's about. But that's not really what it's saying. <laughs> and it's saying that that's, that the outcome is, you know, human nature is very dark, and that that's the dark path we are rushing headlong down towards the othering. Of people and leads only in one place, right? Um, and people need to be careful with how they. Um, well, they aren't being careful. <laughs> we see that in the last couple of weeks. You know, Absolutely. So it's, um, again, it's another warning 
from, you know, for whatever it's worth. Right. Um, what about track nine, Death, Holy Death? Well, the, well, actually, the other thing about against all against all to say is that like, there's one other element to it, which is a very, it's like the taking on of a character um, within the lyrics. You see, there's another voice, another kind of voice in there. Yes. And what and what that voice is saying to it's mocking. It's mocking um, the West's appropriation of sort of holistic emptiness. It's kind of saying to whatever it is that you've chosen to think that such a thing as peace and harmony can exist, whether it's your absorption of modern kind of like pseudo Viking pagan, you know, this, that, the other, or Buddhist or whatever. It just all it's all the song is saying is that the streets will run with blood no matter when, no matter where throughout history, every city, every town is forged in that. Um, it's not necessarily saying that I, <laughs> that's entirely my worldview, but sometimes you take artistic license as a character. So the tone of that song is really very, very dark in that it's almost mocking anybody for having any possible consideration of hope. Right. It's just basically like, like a hammer blow to any holistic notions of society because it states human nature as the gulag. So um, I just wanted to pour every ounce of negativity into a nihilism into that lyric just to, you know to brighten your day <laughs> hey, you absolutely did it's and you did it's it's incredible <laughs> um, what's the next one what's the next one oh uh death holy death track nine yeah this is um i was in where was i um i was in um italy in sicily okay um and there was a big religious parade in the streets that echoed back through hundreds and hundreds of years with all this kind of like religious iconography and floats and, um, you know, the, the, the virginal um, character who had been, um, you know, stripped and beaten and walked through the streets. And um, that's a really simple song because I was watching it and before the parade started, there was somebody um, singing Hallelujah in the street. And so that, that sometimes the lyrics aren't, they don't have some big, Deep meaning. They're just about. They're just visual, and they're just. It's just a song about religious pageantry hmm. and tradition, and how it's formed in um, centuries-old practices sometimes, and how that there is something beautiful about it. So that's kind of that song, really. Again, brilliant. Uh, and then the final track, track ten: "Victory has a thousand fathers; defeat is an orphan." Yeah, there you go. Quote from John F. Kennedy. I quite liked it, so I just appropriated it, just took it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's again, it's a kind of simple song. It's, it's that's the song with the video. That if you've seen the video, um, where we're all you know wearing, um, I think 16th century Irish yes, sir. Um, get up. Yeah, so it's a really pretty simple song. It's just about, um, I suppose, the fate of a young man or woman. Um, um, in you know during one of those sort of like ancient battles, fifteenth, sixteenth century, how you must if you were living outside the castle walls or whatever, how you must have dreaded the sound of hooves clattering in the distance and right. um, about the, the the savagery of um, uh, the savagery of the Middle Ages. I suppose could sum up that song on some level, you know. Um, but it's not, it, you know, it's not got some huge. Uh, deep, deep, deep meaning. I suppose that's really what it's about. So to ask you this, as you know, you've got the 10 tracks, was there stuff left over from this album that you didn't? No. Have? Okay. Not really, no. I mean, there's always riffs and bits and pieces and stuff, but there was nothing, nothing unusual, no. Nothing really left up. And as far as... Um, the production, did you guys do a different approach or is it the same approach as the last album? Always the same. No file trading, no click track, no tempo map, no cutting and pasting, no, um, as little digital interference as possible. It's still us in a room playing. Um, you know, of course there's some overdubbing guitar and stuff, but you try and lay down everything and as much as possible. Drums, one, two takes, don't fuck around vocals. Two of the songs are one takes. Um, though I don't go over and over things. Never did. Um, never will. Not interested in that. <coughs> Sabbath can do it. 
Some of us can do it in a weekend in 70. We can surely do it in two weeks in 2023. Incredible. And that's the way heavy metal should be. It's not meant to be um, a, an anti-human process. So we do it um, the old-fashioned way. I love that. Um, now, have you guys done all 10 studio albums in the same spot? No, never. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we've, or there are, or some of them are with different people. But we and we've done some of the old ones in the same studios, but in the Academy Studios in, in Yorkshire. But even they were different studios. That's I don't think it's healthy to just keep returning to the same place and the same methodology. Sure. And the albums should sound a bit different and have different characters and different um, be different sonic. They shouldn't be the same thing. Um, and that's kind of important for for us. You know, like they should have different bass tones. It shouldn't just be the same plug in as the album before. Sure. Or the same engineer. Or the same whatever. So, you know. Now, as far as the, the production, mixing, and mastering, was it different for this record? No, not really. I mean, some different people involved, but fundamentally the same principle. I mean, most of the records I sit there and um, I'm part of the mixing thing, but you've got to trust in someone else to do all those things. But again, to me, it, just, it should sound like a band playing in a room. If it doesn't sound like that, I'm, I'm just not interested. You know? I think it's better to. To, to have what would be in modern circumstances considered a 3 out of 10 production with character. Absolutely. 6 out of 10 or 7 out of 7 out of 10. That's awesome. That's a point. Um, what about the artwork for this record? Um, uh, there was a few different ideas, um, but I we, there was a pub, we recorded the album in the Dublin Mountains and there was a pub near where we were staying up there which had this poster in in, the, uh, in one of the corridors and originally that farmer in the cover has a sheath of wheat not a gun mm. and I took a picture of it and then I just put a gun in his hand instead of a sheath of wheat I wanted I'm really into, I really like propaganda art um, from like the 20s and 30s um, but I wanted it to look Irish and not like Soviet for example so sure. um, that's what it that's what it is it's originally it's a it's from the 1920s it's the cover of a farming magazine wow very cool. Um, I always love your all's artwork. It always goes right along with the music. I think you've nailed it on all 10 releases. It's just incredible. Um, some, some not. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I'm always ecstatic. I love, I, it's so exciting to get my hands on uh, new material from you guys, and I always love the artwork. Uh, uh, I think that's what drew me to you guys initially, what got me to become a fan. Um, well, you yeah, know, they're they're all pretty good. I mean, well, I mean, I don't like Storm Before Calm, the original, that shit. But no. um, most of them, yeah, they're 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 in and around about. And then, as far as um, I've got to ask you this because I've always wanted to ask you this: with this much material now, how hard is it making a live set? Ugh, it's hard, man, really. <laughs> um, because very often at a festival you get 45, 50, 55 minutes and. All of our songs are six, seven, eight, nine minutes long. Sure. And people would always go, why didn't you play this? Why didn't you play that? And then what happens is songs that you look forward to playing live drop out. There are still songs are on the album where Greater Men Have Fallen that I don't think got enough time. Um, like Come the Flood or something just off the top of my head. Sure. You know, great song, I think. Um, just gone now. Gone forever. Um, and you, because we don't do huge long tours... Um, like when we play weekend shows, our own tour we do an hour and a half um, with openers. But I like a two hour, two hour, 20, 25, 30 set. I know that's hard now. The modern age of people's attention spans are just straight to bits. But I like a big, long fucking set to play. Um, and when you have this many albums and this long songs, then that's, yeah, that's what things get left out so yeah it's very difficult because people expect to hear the coffin ships and empire falls that's like playing and not playing ace of spades in the iron fist sure or something you know um people expect that and if they haven't seen you like if they've seen you two three times they get pissed off and like why didn't you play this and like, but ah you know it's difficult oh yeah i can only imagine um and are you guys got some shows coming up or did you do shows this past summer I, i'm not actually sure i was curious about that we just did a we just did like three weeks with Paradise Lost in Europe. Awesome. Um, and then, well, we, we have weekends and festivals now next year. We're, we're playing in Maryland Death Fest next year. Oh, co my co-host will be there, so he'll get to see you. 
Yeah, we're playing that, and then we have, five, I think, five shows in America after that for the first time in like 10 years. So. Man, that is awesome. I have to see if I can catch one of the other. Uh, I've never been a big festival guy, but I, I definitely, if you're all doing a, a, a something outside of that, maybe you have to check that out. Yeah, maybe if you're, do, if you're somewhere down south, you know. I understand the festival thing, yeah. It's, um, it can be a trying experience. <laughs> I have PTSD, so it just, and I've also got a lot of health problems, so it's like I just have to be careful. Uh, yeah, I hear you. You know, scary stuff. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you, I've always wanted to ask you this, you guys being a, you know, a, 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 uh, one of my favorite bands. Uh, were you guys uh, fans growing up of Thin Lizzy? Yeah, of course, of course. Thin Lizzy is a, a big inspiration, a big influence. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he... Phil used to live on the, well, his mother um, lived on the same road as my grandmother, who lives, used to live at the top of the hill Wow! from where I grew up. So you would see Phil all the time um, around in the early 80s when you were a kid. Wow. Um, and yeah, my, <clears throat> my aunt used to cut his hair in the 70s and <laughs> um, she was friends with him. And yeah, so I mean, people, you know, it's, um, he would, as a kid, you know, I think he moved to London maybe 81, 82, maybe, but he was always back and forth. You used to see him knocking around down around Hoth and Sutton, which is kind of where I grew up um, in wow. the early 80s. Yeah. Absolutely yeah, Thin, Thin incredible. Lizzie, Thin, Thin Lizzie, um, yeah, big influence. Big, 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 we're all big fans of Thin Lizzie. I had went to see, with a friend of mine, we'd went to see Black Star Riders. I never got to see Thin yeah, Lizzie, unfortunately, and... Scott was just standing outside, and the first thing he asked me was, "How did it sound?" And I'm sitting. I couldn't believe I was shaking his hand. So I'm, I'm a. Everything you just told me, it's just music royalty. I think they're the most underrated band on this planet, and I absolutely adore them. So. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean they are. They are Thin Lizzy, not Lizzie. Black Star, right? You know what I mean. <laughs> I totally know what you mean, and also, you know, them. They were kind of doing the twin guitar just before Priest made it famous as well, you know, so, um, yeah, they're one of the greatest rock bands of all time, without a doubt. Um, I mean, there, I will say that on my lot of albums, there's a couple of songs where I'm just like, uh, guys, what, what's going on with Fats? Or what's going on with, <laughs> um, you know, S&M or something? I'm like, mm, so is it always one or see, like, would you take ACDC or something? It's generally all muscle, all killer, no filler. Like if you listen to um, Absolutely. You know, Power Age or Highway to Hell or something, Lizzy always had a, often a song I'm a bit puzzled by. But then again, the next song, you know, it could be a Massacre or something. And you're like, yeah, all right. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the greatest bands of all time, no doubt. Incredible. Well, I can't thank you enough so much for your time today. Uh, kids, check out How It Ends and all their other amazing releases from Primordial, Metal Blade Records. Yep. Um, and also, and also, grown-ups and middle-aged people and older people also check. It out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, they're an incredible band. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Hey, this is Doctor West. You can suck my dick.